good morning. Thank you for having me. I can tell I'm at cardiology conference while you guys are wearing ties. You go to emergency doctor's conference, it will never be a tie at 6.45 in the morning. Uh, so uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of insight in the emergency department world. It is, it is very different. Dan sits here, got up there and said, y'all admit them all, every single one of them. And for heart failure, that's probably true. Uh, we do admit almost all of them, and I'm going to try to explain why. There's 141 million people who go to the ER today in 2019 over the course of the year. About 13 point, or sorry, 3.4 million of those will be with shortness of breath. And if you do the math for heart failure, it's about 1% of all ER visits are shortness of breath. So there's a disconnect there. Not everybody with shortness of breath has heart failure. And that's really where the rub comes in, is because it's difficult as hell to send somebody home who says they're short of breath, because this is one of those you're going to die symptoms. They think it, and I might think it. So we, we have to be very concerned about this. So this is my concern. i got to send you home, pry you out of the ER, and get you out of my, my uh, shop. And that's not going to happen with shortness of breath. It's really hard. And so unless you can be very certain of the diagnosis and tell them, you can ignore this, go home, it's hard to send them home. So the first question is, what is the diagnosis? Um, it's not heart failure. I, you know, somebody sends you a patient, they've been sorted and x-rayed and thought and examined and talked to, and the probability of heart failure at least is likely. Um, but when you see my patients, the probability of the next guy having heart failure is 1%. So if there was some way for me to know who had, who had heart failure, it'd be really convenient. Like if they had it tattooed on their head. So I got on the, on the internet and I said, well, does anybody have it on their head? And it's like, well, this guy does. He's obviously a psycho. <clears throat> but this is not what people come in. This lady's 100 and having a cigarette. What do you think her diagnosis is? So that's an easy one also. She's got COPD, of course. But after that, it's not so easy. And you're in, up in this gray zone, what I call the pie of dyspnea. And these are all the diagnoses people come in, some of which will kill you and some of which won't. And that little slice at the bottom is called heart failure. And all the rest are something else. And so congestion or not is really not the start of my conversation. Is it going to kill you? Is it important? And is there a treatment that I can do to make you better? So this is really what it comes down to is, should I send you home? Because I get really two options. As long as you don't die in my department, I either admit you or discharge. And I can admit everybody, which is what the general consensus is. And insurance companies will sort those out. Or I can discharge everybody. And eh, some of you die and my lawyer will sort that out. That's not an in ending that I want to be part of. And so neither one of these options really work. We have to sort people based on something. And the thing to worry about is the discharge. Because if I admit you, it's somebody else's problem. I mean, that's a dirty little secret of emergency medicine. And if I discharge you, it's all on me. And so there is a tremendous bias to, unless you're absolutely stable, and we're pretty certain, you're getting in the house. Why do we admit so many? Well, it comes down to this. It's the relationship between emergency physicians and lawyers, and it looks something like that. It's not a pleasant one. We estimate that the average doc in the emergency department gets sued after every 5,000 patients. And in a busy shop, you can see 5,000 patients in a year or two. So this is our reality, and this is the bias. And the, what happens if you keep getting sued? You keep seeing Judge Judy? Well, then you're not working anymore, and you're going to go work in McDonald's because nobody wants a doc who's gotten sued 10 times to be part of their group. So there is a real problem here. The other is this. You don't go into emergency medicine or any other field of medicine because you want to hurt people. You want to help people. This is one of the largest studies I can find, 13,934,542 patients. It's bigger than Denver. And this, is the, this was done in Canada, and they looked at, well, how long do you stay in the emergency department? What's the probability of death? And the magic is six hours. If you stay more than six hours, your odds ratio of death is 180%, 1.8. That's if you're high acuity. But it's the same for low acuity. And low acuity people aren't supposed to die, but they have a higher risk. So the longer you stay in the ER, the more your risk is. So there's not just do I want to know the diagnosis. I need to know it quickly because I don't want people staying there six and eight hours while I screw around. People look at me and go, well, Frank, those are Canadians. I go, really? Do you think it's different for Canada? And it's like, well, okay, let's say it is. Here's a study of 62,000 people in Australia. Well, every hour you stay in the ER increases your risk of death by 10%. So six hours, 1.6, it's almost exactly the same data. So we can say Canadians and Australians are the same. And the study I did, at the time I thought it was pretty big, it's 42,000 patients, but compared to these others, not. Um, and the longer you stay in the ER with an MI, the less likely you are to get MI-guided care. And we know that that is associated with increased death. And here's a study of 694 patients who didn't get antibiotics because they stayed too long, and 13,000 patients who didn't get their pain treated. And this is 162 people who spent the night in the ER, and they had a third of rate of bad events like CPR, which is, you got to admit is a bad event. So out of 14 million patients, hanging out in the ER is really bad for you. 
So time is critical for us. That's why we think about it. If you give me a four-hour test, I'm going to laugh at you because I can't use it. But a 45-second test, this becomes a real deal. This is something that if it provides me accurate, actionable data, I'm pretty much done. Here's the other challenge we have. This is the press gainy. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. They call your patients after you see them and say, did you like your doctor? Was it nice? Did he offer you a Chardonnay? And it, it is swings on time for the emergency department. If you look at this bottom part, if you stay in the emergency department for less than an hour, they love you. 90% of the patients will rate you well. But if you stay more than four hours, 22, by one in four, don't like you anymore. So this becomes another driver, patient satisfaction, which is now part of our reimbursement schedule. So it works like this, please save my life, but don't take too long, which is 19, 2019. So this is my favorite song. It's called Closing Time. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. And four hours is the number. So that's how we think about it in the emergency department. And after that, we have to play emergency department roulette, which is somebody's gotta go home or be admitted. It's a decision. So here's what we've been doing with the REDS device. We just ask, in an unwashed, messy population like the emergency department, can it help us make a diagnosis in the undifferentiated shortness of breath patient, which is what we see. I want you to see what is the standard currently for that. If, if this is the BNP trial, 1,500 patients, they came in, the doctor had clinical judgment. The dirty secret of emergency department is everything happens fast, and how accurate can you be in two hours? Well, you're a hell of a lot better after two days. So clinical judgment gets you right about 74% of the time. In other words, you're wrong one out of four. And if you add B and P to that, now we get up to 81 and a half. So you're wrong only 18% of the time. But the, the important part of that is this is the best technology we have. So can we add to this technology that means we're wrong one out of five when we say somebody has shortness of breath due to heart failure? So we, we did an all-comer trial. You just couldn't be pregnant. And you had to be old enough to sign the consent form. And we looked at, um, and we got rid of people who obviously do not belong in heart failure groups, chest trauma and that sort of thing. And we put the device on. This is my uh, research nurse there. Um, I used a bunch of em emergency medicine residents to do the study. And then at the end of it, the diagnosis was adjudicated by two emergency physicians who were blinded to what happened with the REDS device. So they just looked at the x-ray and all the data. If they get to the cath lab, we got that data. But they came up with an accurate diagnosis. Now, my ER looks like 52% are Hispanic, so you're going to have to take that with a uh, grain of salt. When we did the biomedicine data, we found out that African Americans have a different standard, and we don't know that data for this uh, technology yet. So uh, that's just this is because I work in te Texas. And these are the diagnoses we got. Acute coronary syndromes, anxiety, coronary artery disease, GERD, pulmonary embolus, pneumonia. Heart failure ends up in the other category because it was 1%, and that's the way the ER works. But you can see here the sensitivity and specificities are really pretty good uh, for the diagnosis of congestion uh, if you use the 35% cut point. You can see 85 and 0.78. This is, if you use a 37% cut point, you end up with a almost 90% uh, sensitivity. So if I say it's not congested and send you home, I'm probably right. Overwhelmingly uh, better than the clinical uh, gestalt or using BNP. Uh, specificity is 0.83. So this is, uh, uh, a 45 second test that we can do in triage and I know almost immediately where that patient's trajectory is going to be because if you have no congestion the list of diagnosis of shortness of breath is really quite long but if you're congested it's about three things and most of them are heart failure so it's renal failure which is usually obvious uh, uh, liver failure which is always obvious or heart failure so it's a single center study, mostly Hispanic, small sample size. Uh, we've continued to grow that. We've got uh, a few hundred patients now. Um, but if you are, uh, have a, a REDS that's positive in the first couple minutes of hitting the ER, you're getting heart failure therapy. So where do we go next? I keep telling the company we've got to do a big registry and follow this and connect that with outcomes and downstream. Um, you all can help pester them for me on that. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Chen.